My name is Tony Holler and I'm happy to be here talking about feed the cats and speed training and how, how that applies to the sport of lacrosse. I'd like to thank Grady Breen for everything he's done for me. Um, he's exposed me to the, uh, to the world of lacrosse, a world that I did not know anything about until about four years ago. And since then, I've, I've consulted with probably 10 of the best NCAA programs uh, in the nation. And uh, many of the teams have adopted some of my ideas, if not all of them. And so what I'm going to talk to you today about is basically what I would talk to NCAA coaches and strength and conditioning coaches um, on how they can feed the cats in lacrosse at the college level. After that intro, uh, I go right to uh, 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 the heart of the matter, and that is that we need to see tradition as not something we want to cling to, but we want to seriously question everything about the tradition of sports in America, including the sport of lacrosse. I believe that tradition is the status quo. I believe tradition is almost a religion. Uh, we, we cling to tradition. And the tradition of sports in America, this is a, a track tradition, but basically the practice sucks. And uh, this is an athlete from Purdue University who says that he hates practice on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then he can't wait for the meet and loves the meet. And then on Sunday, his body hurts and he hates track. And in 24 hours, this uh, tweet got retweeted 934 time, times and had 3,812 likes. That means that, that athletes all over the nation not only thought this was kind of humorous, but they could relate to it. One of the responders was a former Olympian and a coach, and he says, I love coaching track and delivering pain. This is, uh, this is kind of like a problem, I think. And it, it's, it's everywhere, and, and I think people just accept it. People loved when Norman Dale in the movie Hoosiers said, my practices aren't designed for your enjoyment. Practice was just the hell that we had to go through, the misery that we went through in order to get to play in the games. I see uh, uh, teams put out uh, videos like this. This is from a nationally ranked high school in Oklahoma, uh, a football team. And they think this is what makes them, maybe gives them the, the winning edge, makes them tougher than other teams. This comes from uh, Georgia where they brought in some military guy, some Navy SEAL, and having them do all kinds of, of terrible stuff. You know, this is borderline abusive, but, you know, this is sports in America. This is everywhere. This is a school in Texas who's uh, highly successful, and they, they think that things like this is what gives them the edge. Once again, sports in America. This comes from a, uh, a coach in Miami who... Uh, Come on, man, hurry up, man. One big push-up. This kid's. This was his first track practice in the summer, and this coach was so proud of this video, he put it out to the world on Twitter. Here's a coach in Colorado. I mean, I don't go around looking for this stuff. This stuff finds me. Can you imagine what happens if a kid kills himself on these stairs? And this is one of my favorites. We're going to toughen kids up. Remember, this was not done with a secret video. This is something that these guys are proud of. And I just see it as just dumber in hell. I've coached for 43 years. My dad coached basketball at the high school and college level for 47. And, and I see stuff like that, and I'm like, I, I just, it's indefensible. But 
you see as humans, all of our surviving ancestors, and they all survived, all of our ancestors survived long enough to have children or else they wouldn't be our ancestors. They were protected by believing in the group, by accepting traditions of the group. They survived by, by joining a clan, a tribe. Um, they, it protected them. The lone wolf oftentimes did not live long enough to have children. So it's in our genes that we want to belong and to belong, we have to believe what everybody else believes. I like Mark Twain. He said, uh, when you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's kind of what I've done. I've built a new model. I built it for myself 25 years ago, but now I'm giving it away. And a lot of people kind of see the value in the new model. Up until the age of 40, I coached old school. I coached just, just like my dad. My dad coached for a long, long time. And he was a great coach, but I coached just like him. I copied other successful traditional coaches. I used to visit Bobby Knight. I was a basketball coach in my early days. I used to visit Bobby Knight at the University of Indiana, and, and I would hang on every word. I was intolerant of losing. I was a poor loser, and I thought that was a good thing because good losers probably lost a lot. And I didn't want to be a good loser. I believe that you had to outwork the competition and then brag about it. Always telling your team, nobody works harder than us. And I use the term, we turn boys into men a lot. And it's, it's weird. We never hear in the modern days of women's sports that nobody talks about turning girls into women. But there's a weird thing in America about turning boys into men. And I also bought into the idea that practice is going to suck. It's going to be miserable. It's, it's going to break us down. But that somehow it's all justified when we win games. When did it all change? It changed around 1999. And these three words really hit me hard. Uh, my, my son Alec said, Dad, track sucks. I was the head track coach at the time. My, my son could dunk a basketball in the eighth grade. And I thought to myself, if, if an athlete like my son doesn't want to be in my sport, maybe it's time to try a new model. I, I, I said that I'm going to copy nobody. I'm going to build something new and to hell with tradition. I decided I was going to out-athlete the competition. Man, is this important. I don't know if there's anything in Feed the Cats that's more important than the idea that we are going to attract athletes to our program. The team with the best athletes usually wins. So we want to attract those athletes. We want to attract cats. And then we're going to create athletes. It's kind of like if you're a college coach, you're going to recruit great athletes. Yes, and that's what they do. They recruit great athletes. They do a great job with that. But then so many of them fail in the creating of athletes or the improving of athletes. They just lift and run a lot. And then here's another key. This is an absolute key to feed the cats. We're going to make practice the best part of a kid's day. You know, kids get to go through sports one time. I don't, I don't care. I, I call college athletes kids too. They're, they're, they're just grown up kids. And uh, what I've found is that, you know, uh, all these people are saying like, oh, kids these days, they're awful. They are not awful. They're fantastic. Because when kids like something, they're good at it. And when kids really love something, they become obsessed. And, and, they, and they work so hard at what they love. So we have to make practice lovable. That's weird because it's a total departure from everything I've ever believed in when I, by the time I was 40. I mean, I was halfway through my life before I finally evolved. What that creates is what I call the Feed the Cats Endless Feedback Loop, where a coach starts to create a happy, healthy environment. By happy, I mean mentally healthy. By healthy, I mean physically healthy. And we then perform in practice and kids leave with a smile on their face and some gas in their tank. And 
when they do that, they start performing well in practice. And then, and then they start saying, coach, I love this stuff. I love this stuff. You know, what, what else can I do to make myself better? And then we as coaches start to reflect our athletes' enthusiasm. Uh, there's nothing that's more inspirational to a coach than inspirational athletes. We will work forever for kids that want to be there. And it's just a new model where we're going to make practice more like a game. We're going to gamify practice. Steve Jobs said, if you're working on something that you really love, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. What have coaches done traditionally over the last hundred years? They've pushed athletes. They pushed them, pushed them, pushed them. And what I'm saying is let's change that. Let, let's, let's pull our athletes. Let's provide a fertile field for them to grow into the people they need to grow into. Uh, th this video kind of sums up the love, encouragement, joy, success, you know, kids. I, I, let's just say I've never had anything as much fun in practice as the gauntlet is for us when we're speed training. I started doing that 12 years ago, and the first time I did it, even though we'd been speed training for two months, uh, we had 62% of our athletes run the fastest time they'd run in their life. 62%. Since then, it's always between 60 and 65%. We do this typically once or twice a year, but athletes perform better when they like something. Uh, if you're miserable, if you're mentally depressed, if you're physically broken, you don't run the fastest you've ever run. Now, a part of Feed the Cats is what I call the disciplined pursuit of less. I stole this from the book Essentialism by Greg McKean. And uh, if you haven't read Essentialism, please do so. It's an amazing book. I believe in hormesis, which is a, it was really a pharmacological term. Uh, 500 years ago, a guy named Paracelsus said that everything's a poison, nothing is a poison. It all depends on the dosage. I believe that we need to see training as, as a drug and that we dose training. And when I think of, um, of, of, of Paracelsus, I think of aspirin, where two aspirin is the correct dosage. It, it's great for a headache. It's a miracle cure for a headache. But 100 aspirin, will be a suicide. So, um, so aspirin can be both good and bad, just like training can be both good and bad. Scholl said for every substance, small doses stimulate, moderate doses inhibit, large doses kill. When I think of Scholl's, I think more of tequila, that maybe after a shot of tequila, you're having a great time at a party. Uh, after three or four shots, um, it's no longer a, a stimulant. Uh, it, it's, it's inhibiting you. And then, of course, too many shots will kill you. So we need to see training uh, in that way. The hormesis curve looks like this. Now, my, my dad, as a coach, used to call that hump there the uh, point of diminishing returns. He loved to say those words, the point of diminishing returns. That's why his basketball teams never practice longer than two hours, ever. Because he thought a three-hour practice might be a negative day. And not, not just the last hour being negative. It might, a three-hour practice might cause his team to regress. So what we want to do is we want to err on the side of the front of that curve. We don't know where the hump is for every one of our athletes. So we want to err on the side of less. My own experience as an athlete, I think I was way down on the far right of this curve at least in three practices a week. Uh, usually the day before a football game, the day before a basketball game, the day before a track meet, our coaches would back off thinking that would magically solve all of our broken bodies and uh, depressed minds. Um, and it might have done something like that, but, but you can't break kids three days a week. And I, I think that you want to accept the fact that we can get a small gain every day without ever ending up in that adverse effect range. 
Remember that that hot dog that we see here does not taste better with 10 times more mustard on it. I love the metaphor of burning the steak. If, if you err on the side of less, if you accept small wins, then you're basically cooking the steak rare or medium rare, but you're never going over that hump because once you burn the steak, it's ruined. And I believe the same thing happens to athletes. We want to get to the line 80% in shape and 100% healthy rather than the other way around. Sports in America for the last 100 years, it's been the opposite. 100% in shape and 80% healthy was acceptable. And you don't perform well when you're 80% healthy. You don't, your, your team does not perform well when, when uh, 20% of the guys are broken and unable to play in the game. And that stuff happens all the time. But yet as coaches, man, this is deep down in our DNA that somewhere out there, someone is working harder than you. This is what we've grown up. I was a coach. I was a coach's kid. I grew up with this kind of stuff. My life was like a, a, a cliche, a poster. And everything was about if I'm going to be a good basketball player. Well, Pete Maravich and Larry Bird, those guys played eight hours a day. So I played three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, and then played games at night. And my knees hurt all the time. And I never learned to jump the way I should have because I was always tired and broken. Uh, Les Spellman's a very good friend of mine and uh, uh, a business partner. And uh, he, Les is, is, is such a guy. Now, he, in the uh, 2022 NFL draft of the 19 top picks, he trained eight of the, nine, of the top 19 picks in the 22 NFL draft. This guy is a genius. And he says, if you make a profit every day, you'll never go broke. That's feed the cats. That's, that's where we want to be in practice. Uh, the t-shirt on the right, no pain, no gain. Uh, is, everybody loves to, you know, that's another thing. It's something about male, you know, men. Men love this pain and, you know, skulls and things like that. Uh, but Charlie Francis, one of the best sprint coaches to ever live, said athletes should never be sore from training. That's a crazy statement, isn't it? Um, now, I think that Charlie was hyperbolic like I am. Char Charlie really didn't say, I, I don't think he meant that they're never going to be sore. I don't think athletes should ever be intentionally sore from training. It's like that, you know, that it, basically he is refuting the no pain, no gain mentality of sports. Coaches everywhere, <laughs> you don't want to wear a shirt like this. Like, where can I find this shirt? This is the uh, uh, Navy SEALs motto, embrace the suck. And, you know, coaches don't want to buy my shirt. Uh, my, my shirt is just different. And, and you know, <laughs> you, you can call me soft, but, uh, but I think that performance is not soft. I don't think winning is soft. So if, if, if I can teach you how to win more games and have athletes that love their sport, by the way, you know, you know who are really tough are people that love something. People that love something will fight for it. Um, you know, you, you don't want to mess with a mom when, when she's protecting her kids. That mom's tough as nails. So, so it, it's a different type of toughness that I'm preaching here. Now, the word grind as a verb means to reduce something to small particles or powder by crushing it. So any coaches that say embrace the grind and wake up and grind, do they really want to crush their athletes into smaller pieces? It's just, a, it's, it's just not a good word. And then if you look up grind the noun, dull hard work or hard dull work. Uh, so... I don't think that's the way practice should be. If you want to be good and have kids want to be on your team, if you want to attract athletes and then make athletes love the craft so much that they'll really give you everything they got, uh, I don't think you should be embracing hard, dull work. Stop doing shit that makes you slow. I'm sorry for the the, uh, the word shit, but... Um, but, you know, I think when you say things like this, maybe people remember it better. So stop doing shit that makes you slow, please. 
Now, this is a really controversial thing, but in Feed the Cats programs, and we've just had, in, in the last month, we've had five football teams, high school football teams, win state championships with sprint-based football, which is also known as Feed the Cats football. And one of the things is they don't condition. None. They do not do pre-fatigue, which is like trying to get real tired for the first 40 minutes of practice. They don't do that. Instead, they work on skills and they play fast. At the end of practice, they don't do gassers. They, they don't do traditional conditioning at all. They let the game prepare them for the game. Also, they don't do tempo. Tempo is when you run sub max and do a lot of it. You know, we're talking about things like 20 hundreds or something. Uh, and, and, and you try to look kind of perky when you're doing it, not like you're, you're sloppy and jogging, but we just don't do tempo. You know, all that running stuff that supposedly magically gets us to be good at our sport, I just don't agree with. One of the reasons I don't agree is because when you're doing endurance type of training, um, bad mechanics becomes a habit. Uh, I say that sprinters are bouncy. There's no bounce here. I say they're snappy. I love the word snap. They're not snappy. There's no elastic stuff going on with these endurance runners. There's no big split of the thighs. When you, you have to go real fast, you have to you know, open up your legs. And there's no power. You're just landing and putting the next foot forward. But there's lots of hard wiring. And what I mean by hard wiring is habit building. And we just don't, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't look like athletes to me. One of my favorite football players, or football coaches, I'm sorry, was Hal Mummy. He was responsible for the air raid offense. Um, uh, he, he revolutionized football um, with his offense and his, the way he practiced and stuff. But he did, he did it at a small school called Iowa Wesleyan. Um, uh, oftentimes, revolutionaries are not top down. They're bottom up. So he's at the very bottom of college football. And his offensive line coach uh, was a guy named Mike Leach. And, uh, of course, he became famous as well. And uh, I love this quote. He was 11-0 at the time, coaching for Valdosta State. And he says, we don't stretch, we don't run sprints, and we don't practice on Mondays and Fridays. And when we do practice, we never go longer than an hour and 45 minutes. We don't waste the player's time. Now, this is blasphemy to the coaching world. What? You only practice three days a week? You don't stretch? You don't run sprints? But he's like, cut all that crap out. Let's, let's focus on performance instead. Endurance will never create speed. And you say, well, speed's not that important. No, I think speed's really important. Every college coach I talk to, I say, who do you recruit? He goes, good lacrosse players, they're athletic. Sometimes they'll say, I recruit athletes. Yeah, athletic or athletes. And if I say, define that, define athletic or define being an athlete, they always say, well, fast, explosive, and then I stop them there. The first word out of their mouth is always fast. Well, if you're working on endurance, you may feel you know, proud of yourself you know, running stadium stairs for 60 minutes, but you're not going to get faster. This is the typical look of great athletes doing conditioning, eyes closed, you know, terrible mechanics. All You can tell all these guys are great athletes. They're probably fast too, genetically fast. That's why they're on the team. But they're having the cat run out of them. They are miserable. And eventually what happens, especially in today's world, is that athletes don't want to be on this team. They just don't, especially if, if there's a feed the cats team somewhere else that, that prioritizes performance instead of misery. And then you have to address the weight room. You know, there's way too many S and C people that you know, there's in the university of Illinois S and C guy, his first name's tank. And, uh, he was born, he, no, not born, I'm sorry. He probably was born in a weight room, but he, he married his wife in a weight room. Think about that for a minute. He married his wife in a weight So it's kind of like the weight room is his church almost. And there's too many people who see the weight room as church. And so they chase infinite strength 
and infinite strength does not produce speed. Matter of fact, guys that look like this are all slow. None of them are fast. So I'm not anti-strength at all. I just think the strength is a small part of, of being an athlete. Remember, uh, the, out of the first three things those coaches say about athletes, fast, explosive, usually strong is not even the next word. Now, you say explosive means strong. Yes, it does. It means strong um, in a high-speed way. So, so what you need to do is stay general in the weight room and then be real extreme in your speed training. And, and this really, you know, uh, uh, blows people's minds. My dad used to say, we're going to work so hard in practice that the games are going to be easy. And we all shook our head like, this guy is so smart. You know, that's why we practice so hard. But here in a feed the cats way, I say the opposite. It's counterintuitive. If I say allow the games to be the hardest thing we that we do, I'll allow the games to be hard. What this means is we can we don't have to work three hours a day because we have a two hour game. We can work an hour a day and let that two hour game be hard. So what we want to do especially in the off season, but this should be in your mind all the time is the building of apex predators, which this is just a cute way for me to say, we want to build athletes, but see, we get confused because a lot of times we think we need to reverse engineer the game. Uh, Curry runs uh, 2.71 miles in a typical game for him. Uh, he plays about 34 minutes a game. Uh, the average speed is not even under 12 minutes mile pace. Uh, some people might think that he needs to be going on three mile runs. That would be reverse engineering the game. Let's prepare him for what he has. No, let the game be hard. He needs to train speed, explosive. He needs to, especially as he ages, he needs to become a better and better athlete. If you don't do that, he's going to decline. As a, an older basketball player slows down, can't jump anymore, they're no good. So you just get rid of this idea that we need to prepare him for the endurance of a game. You know, you, you need to improve athleticism. Another example of this, probably one of the best, is that I've been told by soccer coaches that um, hey, we, you know, we have to run over nine miles in a game, blah, blah, blah. Well, reverse engineer that. That means you need to be doing like nine miles of sprints or a nine mile run every day, every other day. So, no, no, no. If you look at this picture, is this girl, does this girl look like a marathon runner? Heavens no. She wouldn't be any good in the marathon. You don't want her to be good in a marathon. No matter how much a soccer coach will tell you that endurance is a key to their sport. If you ask them, describe your best player. Describe the player that wins games for you. They will always say fast explosive. Always. But then they go out and run them like they're a cross-country runner or something. Don't run the cat out of your athletes. So we want to let lacrosse train lacrosse. But away from lacrosse, we're going to train athleticism. Now, when I say train athleticism, I think this clip is, is pretty important. Uh, my good friend Brian Kula has trained Christian McCaffrey since he was like 12. Uh, Christian ran track for him. Uh, he still trains with Brian in the, uh, in the summer. And he does no endurance training at all. None, zero, zip. It's all fast explosive. Oh, and by the way, when he has to do a stupid conditioning test, which I hate, um, with an NFL team like he had to do with the Carolina Panthers, he still wins it because you can still become aerobically fit without doing aerobically focused work. We call it stacking anaerobic work. If you want to see what stacking anaerobic work looks like, watch this clip. But remember, this clip is not showing one very important thing. It's not showing rest intervals. To do the things that Christian's going to do in this clip, you must recover between your work.
This is not endurance work. Remember, you're not seeing the recovery times, but I guarantee you, you don't do that and then wait two seconds later and do that again. <laughs> it, it, it takes sometimes a couple minutes, up to even five minutes. If you run a 40-yard dash, it takes you five minutes to fully recover. We should want all of our training in the cross to look just like the things that you see here. Strong, explosive, fast. Eliminate the shit that makes you slow and focus on the things that win. So when I'm talking about apex predators, I break it down into sprint fast. Of course, that's number one. Number two is lift heavy. You saw that with McCaffrey. Next, it's actually two things, but I call it jump high and jump far. I think there are two different things. And then bounce. If you look through the McCaffrey things that we just saw, you could categorize each and every one as one or more of these four things. By the way, notice that there's no number five that says um, endurance or, you know, bench press. You know what I mean? You know, we do say lift heavy, uh, but but these are the, the traits that win games as an athlete. So this is what runs fast looks like. This is my guy. That guy... Uh, was the fastest high school kid in the history of the state of Illinois. At the age of 14, when he was a freshman for me, he ran 10.40 in the 100, which is the world our all-time world record for a 14-year-old. Um, he ran 9.99 at the University of Texas uh, last year. Or so, so he's you know he's an amazing sprinter. But that's what fast looks like. Now, lift heavy is really important. Um, but remember that, or maybe I'm telling you something here. There's not a single lift in the weight room that directly creates faster runners. You know, no matter what lift you point at, you know, I could say, well, yeah, fast guys are usually pretty good at that lift, but I've seen a lot of slow guys that are good too. So there's nothing that I can like pick fast guys out by seeing them do things in the weight room. Jump high. These are five of my guys jumping high. And by the way, you know, I said that there's nothing in the weight room that directly uh, indicates speed. This does. Guys that can jump like this are all going to be all state track athletes. They're all going to be super fast. So if this is how fast guys do things, man, shouldn't we be taking our slow guys or our generic guys and have them do things like this? Jump far, totally different thing. We're trying to jump over this this uh, nine foot white line here. Nine foot's a pretty good standing long jump. And by the way, the guys that jump the highest for me or jump the farthest, either one, are usually my fastest athletes. And then bounce, bounce. You know, you say, well, this looks like a jump, but it's really a bounce. And and I think bounce is very underrated. What is is reactive force and guys that bounce well really change directions well. And I know that's really important in the cross. But, you know, I don't care what the sport is. Um, if I had golfers, I would train them with the same athletic stuff that you're seeing here. Now, the atomic speed workout, something I created. Atoms are the smallest parts of matter, but the atom has incredible energy locked inside of it. So what I did 
actually for lacrosse athletes through Jamie Monroe's organization, JM3. Shout out to Jamie, very good friend of mine. Um, uh, a lot of those kids were so busy. They went to private schools, tons of homework, you know, they had practice every day and they just couldn't find time to do like an hour workout. So what I did is I came up with a 15 minute workout. I call it the atomic speed workout. And I think this is the smallest possible workout that you could do two times a week and get faster. Hey, this is Lavelle Patterson. Today we are going to do the 15 minute atomic speed workout. In this workout, we're going to do 10 speed drills that will take us about 10 minutes, and then we're going to do two sprints. In all, it's only going to take us 15 minutes, and Lavelle is only going to do 60 seconds of work, but the work that he's going to do is very high quality, high intensity, and super fast. This is the shortest, smallest workout that, that I've come up with that will actually have a positive impact on speed. So what we're doing here, we're doing 10 speed drills in 10 minutes. That was a fast march. That's an A skip, very snappy. Obviously, your kids won't look like this because they haven't done this for three or four years yet. That's the third thing. Now we're going to a bouncy thing. Here's the fifth drill. These are speed bounds. Another bouncy thing, pogo jumps. That's the sixth. Now we've done six and six minutes. These are straight legged, short prime times. Everything's in front of us, super fast. Now we go big prime times. Everything in front of us, legs straight. Now we go bent knee prime, still everything in front, but we bend our knee. The last thing we do is we accelerate and work on that, and we try to get to top speed because now we're ready to sprint. Here's our first timed sprint, and we're doing a 10 yard fly. Then we have to go five minutes recovery. Now's our second fly. He runs a 0 0.89, which is an amazing, amazing 23 miles an hour. All in all, he did, if you counted every second of that video, now obviously we cut out the rest times, but he did 69.4 seconds of work, period. That's all the work he did. He did that in a 15 minute period. So it is, it is a lot of bang for the buck, just like an atom is small, but it has a lot of power locked inside. So I never really meant, I meant this to be just a way to get busy lacrosse kids out the door twice a week and get faster or not get slower. Um, but what's happened is that there's hundreds of football teams, probably a hundred in Texas alone that have replaced their warm up twice a week with my atomic speed workout. They are literally <laughs> timing sprints during the week. Of course, TCU made it to the NCAA football championship game last year. Um, and they blew people's minds by saying that they were speed training three times a week in season. And it's interesting not only were they doing that to be fast, they were doing that to remain healthy. Teams that speed train during the season report back that they've had no soft tissue injuries all year. I don't know why, except for, I guess it accustoms your uh, tissues to high speed performance, game speed type of play but teams just don't get hurt because they're getting this low dose of speed. So in review, it's a 15 minute workout, 10 speed drills, two sprints, 60 seconds of work. You do this two or three times a week. Remember that speed grows like a tree. Uh, the, the tree in my front yard, I don't know if it grew or not last summer, but if I would have measured it in the spring and measured it in the fall, I would have found out it grew. I'm pretty sure. Same thing with speed. It grows like a tree. You can't really see changes, so we have to measure speed. And we do with a, a free lap timing system. Uh, I, I can't imagine coaching any sport 
without sprinting. And I can't imagine coaching any sport without a free lap. Now, what do we do on the days if we want to get fast? What do we do on the days where we're not sprinting? So we're going to work on those things that are really important. Bounce, snap, power, the big split of our thighs, and also creating habits. So by snappy, this is a snappy lunge. We call it a snappy lunge. We want that. Like If you think that's easy to bring that foot through that, that quickly, with that much elasticity, like a tight rubber band, try that sometime. You will not look like this guy because this guy can run 10.71 in the 100. Now, some things will actually do a lot of different important things like a big split, snap, bounce, and I would even add in power for these air lunges. Bouncy, big split snappy these are the types of exercises we do on x-factor days with a lot of recovery this looks a lot like the McCaffrey stuff we do leg swings now everybody kind of does this as a warm-up we don't warm up with it we perform we're going as high as we can in the front high as we can in the back we're get hitting a little dirt or a little ground on every swing and we do this until we get tired and then we quit which is usually about six seconds. Everything is at performance level. And every, there's, if you watch our X Factor workouts, it's mostly stand around. Because you got to stand around a lot to perform at performance levels. But you win games by doing things at performance level. You don't win games by going at 50%. Uh, we do wickets. Right now they're laying down. Um, you don't see the whole run in, but we sprint in about 20 yards, 25 yards, maybe sometimes we put the wickets up six inch. Uh, but if you lay them down on the ground, six feet apart, six feet apart, usually about eight of them, um, nobody ever knocks them down and guys will still go over like they're supposed to. We are hardwiring good mechanics when we do that. Very important. And, and this is the same guy except for a steel frame and this is what a sprinter looks like so he's stepping over that hurdle like like it's a, still a six inch hurdle it's still a barrier in his brain and so we are getting into i call this the power position of a sprinter and who lacrosse kids really they've never done this in their life lacrosse kids have never sprinted they only run and so it's really important to get them uh, to raise that ceiling of speed. Sometimes we time wickets. Those are obviously not laying down. I'll show you that again. When you time things, you change things. We do bounces. Remember, bounce is one of the things that we want to get better at. Just a simple way to bounce. You say, well, gee, couldn't you like jump rope and get? Yes, jump rope is a great thing to do on X Factor, except for don't do the ropes for uh, endurance. Do it for bounce, which means you you jump rope real fast, you bounce you bounce uh, in, a, in a very uh, uh, performance-like way, and then when you get a little tired after about 20 seconds, you drop the rope, rest, do it again maybe. Uh, this is called an extreme ISO lunge, where we're just holding this position. Um, the front heel is up, and you might be able to see the crazy magic that happens in this kid's body. You see the shake going on. We call this the jackhammer effect. That's from co-contractions. Uh, there's no soreness uh, next day from doing isos. You only get sore from doing eccentric stuff, the elongation of a contracted muscle. And since there's no elongation going on here, it's just a co-contraction. But um, there's just a huge returns to doing extreme iso lunges. Uh, big, another big split drill. Just We did a snappy lunge earlier for you. This is a long lunge. Working on that big split. We do power stuff. Love med balls. This is a 14-pound med ball. Really a strong kid here. Full extension of the body. Finishing with the hips. Get out of the way so the ball doesn't kill you on the way down. Uh, we, we do uh, all kinds of med ball stuff. 
And it's just a, a great change up from sprinting because we, we can't sprint six times a week or seven times a week. We have to find other things to do. Sometimes we get the just jump mat out. And if you've ever done this, kids will, uh, um, by the way, this is our fastest kid. That's why he jumps high. Uh, by the way, if you get faster, you'll jump higher. But, the, uh, but this is important that when you get this mat out, kids will, kids will do it 10 times. And I think if you jump as high as you can 10 times, that becomes not just testing. It becomes training. So we say training is testing and testing is training. Of course, if you want to push sleds, you know, X factor is the time to do it. If you want to pull something, X factor is the time to do it. And I'm not showing you. I, I got like hundreds and hundreds in my head. I don't have it written down anywhere, but, uh, but we do tons of things on X factor days, but we never get tired. Tired is the enemy, not the goal. Well, we don't want to get sore. Um, so most of it standing around. If you want to change something, measure it. Here we're going to do a standing broad jump. Um, actually, it's a triple broad jump. Um, jump three times, see how far we can go. I doubt if you'll have anybody going 31-6. If, if they do, they should have. They should be winning medals in track and field in the long jump or the triple jump. But still, we want all of our guys to get better at things like that, especially the guys that are bad at it. The guys that can't do this hardly at all, they need to be doing athletic things. Talking about athletic things, same guy, and he is, he's really good. But all of our guys do this, even the guys that don't do it well. This is standing triple jump where he goes from two foot, lands on left, lands on right, and then will land on two feet. I think the triple jump is one of the most athletic things in the world. And that's why all of our guys do the triple jump. And you say, well, you're a track team. I don't care. If, we, if I was coaching any sport that required movement, including golf, I would be doing standing triple jump with them. The next is bounce again. We're just going to bounce here. These are called pogo jumps. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not a pogo jump. This is a uh, box jump. And I couldn't show you everything. Um, these two courses combined are over two and a half hours of information. And they happen to be the two best-selling videos on CoachTube. Now, I have videos on at Championship Productions as well. And the one I produced in 2018 was their number one seller, all sports, including football, lacrosse, basketball, everything. Number one seller was Feed the Cats. Um, I, um, I no longer promote those videos i think they're old um and now my videos are on coach tube and these two um set sales records um in their first two years of being sold so if you want to get into more feed the cat stuff this is where you find it okay speed is the tide that lifts all boats the most extreme movement of the human experience is sprinting max velocity spiked up in a straight line getting timed we are going to challenge our nervous system our cns to fire faster than it's ever fired before that's why speed has such a global effect as you improve your speed your cns becomes improved and the brain always wins uh, my friend chris corfus tells a story of of um, kids with thick glasses when they're young, they don't see well. Um, they're the slowest kids in the class. It's because their brain will not let them run fast because the brain is a protective mother. Well, we want to remove that protective mother part of our brain. And the way we do that is by really challenging it and, and sprinting. When we train the extreme, we train the range. And like I said, speed training is the most extreme thing we can possibly do. I'll show you that again. This is not soft stuff.
You see, that's the free lap timing system. If you're not timing, um, I don't think it's sprinting. Uh, I, I, I think people are just running fast. Uh, to truly time, um, when you time something, you change the athlete. Um, by the way, when you video, you change the athlete. Uh, and, and if you can get to a hard surface, a track, uh, no matter what sport you're coaching, I would encourage track spikes because we want to be as extreme as we can be in our speed training. This is Marcellus. I love that sound. Uh, once again, this is extreme. People say, well, when you're so extreme so much, don't guys get hurt? And it's the opposite. Because we're extreme, we've trained the range. We don't get hurt because we sprint a lot. Our goal is to send lightning bolts in nanoseconds through the wires of our body. That's the CNS control. Muscles are dumb. All They only know one thing. They know contract. And when they're told, when they're, when they're not told to contract anymore, then they relax. Well, we want to light up those muscles in a nanosecond and get a full contraction and then a full relaxation. And that cycle of contract relax is a lot, allows us to sprint and allows us to become good in every other type of movement. Interesting story. Brian Kula trained not one, but two. This is not the person he trained. Um, it's a generic picture, but two girls, um, uh, one's uh, now at Montana University golfing, and the other just won the 5A Golfer of the Year Award in high school out in Colorado. Anyway, they trained two women golfers, girls, just like McCaffrey. Strength, power, speed. They trained them like athletes. They didn't train them like golfers. They did not reverse engineer their sport. They became two miles an hour faster as sprinters. And for those of you who don't know, if you're one mile an hour faster, you are a new person. I mean, one mile an hour is amazing. Well, they got two miles an hour faster and their club speed, their club head speed improved 15 miles an hour. The high school girl is now out driving her dad, who is an excellent golfer. So, um, so is speed the tide that lifts all boats? I sure think so. The same group, Kula Sports Performance, trained Highlands, Highland Ranch Aquatic Swim Club, and they did not train them as swimmers. They trained them as athletes. They trained them sprinting, explosiveness, strength, jump high, jump far, bounce. Even though swimmers don't do any of those things, they do none of those things, but that's how they were trained. They broke 48 club records that following season after being trained at Kula Sports Performance. Speed just not, I, I've heard a coach say one time, well, speed, you know, it's just another bucket. No, it's not. You know, yes, I agree, agility and acceleration, skills, sports skills, strength and capacity, those are all important things, really important. But speed's not another bucket because speed's a tide that lifts all boats. Too many people want to go in every direction equally. They don't know how to prioritize. Even if they wanted to prioritize, they don't know what to prioritize. I, I know, you know, I know that speed's the thing we want to prioritize if we're coaching athletes. Uh, a football coach once, once said to my friend Chris Corfus, Chris is probably uh, one of the top three speed gurus in the world today. Uh, a football coach said, I want you to get my players bigger, faster, and stronger. You know, said every football coach ever or every lacrosse coach ever. And Chris Corfus said, in what order? That means we got to prioritize something. And I think you probably know what order you should prioritize those things in. Uh, because see, speed... As you get faster, your agility will get better. You will be able to stop, start faster, you, um, uh, change directions better. Your acceleration improves. Uh, I've never seen somebody super fast that didn't accelerate well. Uh, your skills, you say, how would that improve our skills? 
Well, the faster you be, the faster you get, the slower the game becomes for you. It's like you start to see the game in slow motion because your CNS is so fast. So your skills will actually be accentuated by your improvements in speed. Uh, ask any weight room coach what the best warm up for the weight room is, and they'll say a CNS warm up. In other words, sprinting. And then capacity is your ability to run multiple sprints. If you can run 23 miles an hour, you can run 20 miles an hour all day. You could run 100 sprints at 20 miles an hour if you can run 23. So the faster you get, your capacity to do work improves too. I love Mark Ellis. Uh, he was my contact guy at Princeton. And of course, Princeton fed the cats. Um, actually, they fed the tigers, they called it. And uh, they had great success. And uh, Mark is now at uh, Northwestern University. Just got the job last summer. And he's spectacular. He's only 29 years old. Uh, Mark says, for us, it's speed and explosion before anything else. Some coaches are mainly focused on getting athletes bigger. Other SNC coaches prioritize conditioning. At Princeton, we want speed. We don't want the fastest milers. We prioritize fast, explosive, and strong in that order. Obviously, a Feed the Cats disciple, uh, just an incredible guy. And uh, I asked him, I said, now, how, how did that affect your conditioning at Princeton? Did When you stopped doing conditioning and started focusing on, on sprint everything, um, did that hurt you in the fourth quarter? He said, Coach, we ran circles around people in the fourth quarter. It's almost like fast guys are still the fastest guys late in the game. Buddy Morris is my hero from the NFL. And Buddy's different because he was not like born in a weight room. Instead, uh, Buddy actually still holds his 100 meter school record from high school. So he was a speed based SNC guy. And he says, we train our skilled guys like Olympic sprinters and our big guys like hammer throwers. But everyone is exposed to max velocity. Everyone. And you may think, well, gee, offensive tackles, they don't ever sprint. Why do they sprint? It's because when you sprint, you're a better athlete. The faster you are as an offensive tackle, the faster you take a first step and a second step. The faster you go backwards. The, the more balance and coordination you have. That's why the slowest offensive tackles at the NFL co combine might not get drafted. The fastest offensive tackles, 315 pounds, 6'5". But the fastest guys go in the first round and make the most money. How do you train a cat? You sprint as fast as possible, as often as possible, staying as fresh as possible. We put all of our energy into prioritizing speed and we get faster because of it. It doesn't mean we neglect everything else. But our priority, our focus, is sprinting. So when I talk to lacrosse people, I tell them, I said, hey, I'll give you an A-plus for speed. You guys all love it. You, you, you recruit speed. You, nobody recruits slow lacrosse players. You love speed. A-plus. It's when they get there that I have to give you bad grades. Your team slows down during the year, so when you enter the tournament, you're not as fast as you were on day one. That's unacceptable. You must speed train during the season. And then none of your guys get faster. If, if you even know, you probably know they get slower as they gain weight and age. And that's unacceptable as well. We should Athletes should be getting faster well into their 30s but when they don't speed train and all you rely on is your genetic speed and you gain weight and you're overworked and you're doing too much endurance crap and you're doing too much weightlifting, you're not going to be as fast as you should be speed amplifies power uh it's it's not that big of a deal to be 6'4 238 
Um, but you know, if you're 6'4", 238 and slow, you're not a very good tackler. But if you're 6'4", 238 and run 4.3940, then you're the first pick in the NFL draft because speed amplifies power. Speed also creates sprint capacity. Sprint capacity does not improve speed. Okay, let me explain this. If, if we can get this guy to run 23 miles an hour, like I said earlier, you can run 20 miles an hour 50 times. But if you're running sub-max speeds 20, 30, 40 times, you're not getting faster doing that. Capacity does not improve speed. And that's, that's what coaches have always done. They have run their guys. Yeah, well, we run sprints. We run like 20 sprints at the end of practice. No, that's not a sprint. That is a fatigued run that does not improve speed, probably is even making them slower. The biggest mistake I see over and over again is people say, oh, yeah, we're, you know, check out our speed development stuff here. There's nothing wrong with this. This is from West Point. Nothing wrong with this at all. Uh, but it's not, it's not speed training. You're running up a ramp. It's hard work. It might be good for you. But this is not making anyone faster. Speed also creates endurance. Uh, this is my guy, Marcellus. I guarantee you the other six guys in this picture all worked harder than he did. They all did 10 200s, 8 400s in practice. Marcellus never did more than three 200s in a practice ever because we focus on speed. And because he was so much faster than these guys, his sub-max speeds were better than the best they had. It's kind of like if you train 100 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour feels comfortable. But if you train, this is traditional, if you train at 60 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour will wear your ass out. And that's how so many football teams, basketball teams, lacrosse teams, soccer teams, they all are sluggish in practice, too much practice, too long, too fatigued. There's never enough recovery. And because of that, they never go at game speeds in practice. And then they expect to go game speed. Yeah, it's just not good. I mentioned Feed the Tigers at Princeton. They made the 2022 Final Four. And um, when they first started, this is right after our initial consult um, that I did with uh, their SNC staff and all their coaches. They had three guys at 20 miles an hour. 10 weeks later, they had 17 at 20. By the way, 20 miles an hour barely makes my high school sprint group. Barely makes it. Like, like the 20 mile an hour guys on my, in my sprint group are like freshmen. They aren't, all my good guys run 22, 23. So they only had three guys. We're talking about Division I athletes. Only three guys that could run 20. Well, they were a lot better team when they had 17 at 20. And some of the players improved a couple miles an hour. You know, 18.3 to 20.7 is pretty good. And I love the guy at the bottom. 22.2 miles an hour. He was really fast and improved to 23.2. So, you know, that guy could have been sprinting on, on Princeton's track team. You say, well, explain to me what one mile an hour looks like. Okay, I'll, I'll do that right now. DK Metcalf is going to run one mile an hour faster than Buddha Baker. That's Buddha. Here is DK Metcalf. He is running actually 1.3 miles an hour faster. And that's pretty significant. So just imagine if you could improve your team by like 1.3 mile an hour every single guy in 10 weeks. Oh my God, you would be a different team. You would go from, oh yeah, I really like athletes to actually creating athletes. So what do you do when you practice? Uh, the old school pyramid is tons of strength and conditioning, lots of conditioning. Basically you lift and then you get tired. And then a lot of toughness crap and compliance crap, you know, like, you know, this is how we're going to be a good team. 
and then a lot of long hard practice and once again it's not made for your damn enjoyment and eventually you get to sports skills and strategy and games but man it's just i think it's too late it's too late because i believe that winning is more important than hard work call me crazy winning is more important than hard work and i think performance is more important than effort you know coaches are big effort people because they get their team so damn tired they can't perform all they have left is effort that's why coaches focus on effort so my my pyramid has a base of rest recovery and sleep and nutrition and then the next level we're just becoming better athletes sprint lift jump bounce now it has to be built on that rest recovery sleep nutrition because you can't get better at sprinting lifting jumping and bouncing unless unless you have a healthy body and then we get to sports specific skills a lot earlier and then in practice we perform in practice we're not trying to get them tired anymore As a matter of fact tired is the enemy not the goal never let today ruin tomorrow don't ever burn the steak send them home happy gas in their tank take a day off once in a while which allows us to take a healthy team that loves the sport teach them strategy and then win games and the whole thing about toughness i've mentioned it um i get so sick of, of men talking about toughness and you know those navy seals on the right they're really tough guys no question you know you, you look up tough guys you see that picture um but you know what if you put those guys in high heels on, on, on a tightrope way up high they they wouldn't be very tough and I think if you took that girl that's walking the tightrope and put her in cold water with a with a automatic rifle, um, she, maybe she wouldn't be very tough either. So toughness is very task specific. So we want to train athletes for their task and stop doing this artificial toughness crap. You need to set up your practices with high days and low days. Like our high days or sprint days and our low days, our X factor days or off days. So a weekly plan, let's say you had a Friday game, you'd have a performance practice on Monday and Wednesday. That means like game speeds. Now, not doesn't mean real hard because you don't want performance days to be harder than a game. Practice should never be harder than a game. The, the most work you should do in a single practice is maybe 50 to 60% of game demands and so you would take a performance day and then and then a day where you're backed off a little bit kind of like a pre-game day fundamental days are like pre-game where you're working on skills if you're a basketball team you'd be shooting the ball a lot on a tuesday then you have a performance day a fundamental day so it's kind of like you have three games in a, in a week by the way if you had a game on wednesday you would still have three games in that week one performance practice and two actual games and then i think you have to take two days off it is i mean just totally off don't bring them in and run them sprints or don't bring them in and lift them matter of fact i i urge coaches to consider four day weeks i know that's blasphemous but uh, a four day week just creates really healthy happy athletes uh, inside of per performance practice, you cannot be like doing something high and then going to something else that's high. And then you can't perform, perform, perform. You can't perform consistently over a 90-minute practice. So it's kind of like it has to have this wave-like thing where you perform and you recover and you perform and you recover. And what that allows us to do, now the games are going to be harder than practice, but at least you're conditioned, I hate that word, you're conditioned to go at game speeds. Eric Coram, uh, Dr. Eric Coram, a very good friend of mine, says, I think every coach should be uncomfortable with how little they do in the first week. I, I think the only thing I would argue with, I think you should be uncomfortable the whole season. Um, and I would love the word uncomfortable because it, it it's, it's pushing the button that we have as coaches where – we are only comfortable when we work our kids really hard. It's just in us. I mean, I have the same disease as you guys have. Um, it is uncomfortable to see kids 
go home with gas in their tank because, oh man, we could have done a little bit more. But I think it's really important to never let today ruin tomorrow. If we get, you know, a lot of coaches, even old school coaches, give uh, kids a day off after a game. But their practices are harder than games. And they don't give him time off during the week. So I'm just making the point here that that a day off after a game is a good idea. I think everybody agrees with that. But it, but if your practices are harder than games, how come you're not recover? How come you don't respect kids' bodies then? So to solve that, I just say that your practices should never be more than fifty or sixty percent of the total volume of a game. The Devin Wills story is is really important. This kid is a great running back from Mascuda High School. Uh, their coach went to a feed the cats approach. They stopped practicing on weekends, stopped conditioning, um, practices ninety minutes. Uh, their team had no injuries. They won. I think they won every game but one. And uh, he had a big win, and I think the fourth game. And he gave me a call and said, Coach, I got to tell you this story. He said, my guy, Devin Wills, he was incredible last night. He gained 337 yards, 337 yards on 33 carries. And, and we're 4-0. And, and, and we're, <laughs> Coach, he's so good. And I go, was, was he gassed on that 33rd carry? He laughed and said, yes, he was. He said, but he still gained 22 yards on his final carry. And coach, and this is what gives me chills. Coach, there's nothing we could have done that would have made him fresh for that 33rd carry. And I'm like, yes, yes, that's it. Nothing would have made him fresh. We let the games be hard. He said, coach, and he gets to sleep in every Saturday till noon because we're not coming in at 7 a.m. running like we used to. And, Coach, he hasn't done any conditioning all year. We just practice. Cool stuff. The last thing I want to talk to you about is RPR. I'm just going to give you a real quick rundown. Reflexive performance reset's a big deal. Um, Cal Dietz, um, probably the greatest SNC guy, you know, uh, in the country today, University of Minnesota, uh, says it's the biggest secret in sports. And Chris Corfus is the founder of RPR, and he's my business partner great guy and uh basically what it is it's it's breathing this is julian love he plays in the nfl now he's been an nfl player for he was with the giants i think he's with the seahawks now and uh this is when he was in high school and he went to uh, nazareth high school that was a big rpr school and uh and so basically it's a breathing thing where you belly breathe in through the nose out through the mouth great big breaths and then you work on your sternum and your bottom rib with your finger you just go real hard on that bottom rib to your sternum and that that gets your diaphragm working um, even better so you're actually able to take in more air and as this starts to happen your brain changes you go from like an adrenaline sympathetic state is what it's called in science it's a it's a fight or flight state and it gets you parasympathetic Fight or flight is not, contrary to some knuckleheads' beliefs, fight or flight is not a performance state. It's a survival state. This gets you into a parasympathetic state, which is a state of performance. So your belly breathing, no magic in that. You're working on your ribs and sternum. You belly breathe better. And when you belly breathe, it looks like this. Notice that Julian's chest is not moving. It's almost like there's a big balloon in your belly. And then you work on your psoas. Your psoas initiates um, the lifting of your femur. And so you go two inches over from your belly button, two inches down. He's using a activation stick. I, I just, we, when we do it as a team, we just use our thumb and use our other hand to push our thumb deep into our gut. And we do big circles. We do it on both sides of the belly button. Two inches over, two inches down. And then we hit the two glute marks. You know, if 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 breathing, breathing is pretty important. So the first thing is breathing. Second thing is lifting your damn leg. Pretty important to move. And then the, the second thing is put force into the ground, which comes from your glutes. So this is at the very base of your skull in the back. And you just, once again, I don't use the stick. We just use our thumbs and we just 
rub back and forth for about 15, 20 seconds. And then the other spot is under the earlobe, back of the jaw, pressing towards the nose. And this hurts, but you just wince and get get past it. You just you just go hard with your thumb for about 10 seconds. And and then after each one of these, you take like three more belly breaths. And that alone, that, that's only that's only like zone one. There's hours and hours of RPR certification that you can get. Uh, but RPR is huge. Um, University of Michigan, uh, their football team does it. And I saw uh, in their practice, indoor practice facility, they had these like 80 foot tall posters of the RPR spots. I mean, it's, it's, it's like central to their program. It's a, it's a heck of a, per- if you haven't heard of RPR, um, you're missing out on a something that will give you a competitive advantage. And if teams that you're playing against are doing RPR, you're at a disadvantage. So, uh, you know, what, what I'm thinking is that maybe you should look into it. It's really good stuff. I've been using it for about 10 years. And in review, um, if I was going to sum things up here, uh, I'm always trying to come up with more essential like um, definitions for feed the cats. When I say feed the cats is a way to cook. It's not a recipe. It's not a system. It, you know, people say, can you give me the exact? No, I can't give. It's a way to cook. You know, in some ways, it's, it's, it's not doing a lot of the things that we used to do traditionally. Um, and then it's a, you prioritize things. And then the actual implementation will be based on you and where you are. But two words for uh, Feed the Cats, and that's prioritize speed. Remember, speed's the tide that lifts all boats. And then if I'm going to do like a 37-word uh, definition of Feed the Cats, I'd say sprint, record, rank, and publish. That means always write stuff down. You know, you know, you always want to check and see how fast people are. We get motivated when, uh, when, when we see progress. So <laughs> we're big on record, rank, and publish. So let me start over. Sprint, record, rank, and publish. Sprint before lifting. Never let today ruin tomorrow. Accept rest and recovery to create performance level outputs. Stop doing shit that makes you slow. And make practice the best part of a kid's day. That's it. That's Feed the Cats. I always want to encourage people to read books. Uh, my, my top six books I think you should read. And there's only one that's even remotely a coaching book. The Twin Thieves, written by uh, Steve Jones, a really good friend of mine. You know, I just love the guy. He, had, he won 92% of his high school football games in the state of Wisconsin. Once won 70 in a row. Five consecutive 14 and 0 seasons. And so he wrote this book called The Twin Thieves on Leadership. By the, by the way, the th- Twin Thieves are fear of judgment and fear of failure. So it's a book about leadership. So the other five books are not about coaching at all. But I think that um, that all six of these should be maybe not only read, but maybe read twice. Uh, you know, and, and then also handed down to your athletes. Um, they're just, you know, I, I just don't think we read enough and I don't think we read stuff that really improves. Uh-huh.